I think I'd like to start with where we first met Leopold, where we first saw him. We were at a Fish and Game Commissioners in Baltimore, I believe in 1929, and it was very dull, but we needed a job. Frederick had just graduated from Harvard. I had recently flunked out of Smith, and we were job hunting. And suddenly, after all these pompous old guys got up and talked, a very lean, tan man with a very lithe, quick step walked down the aisle, and I said to the gentleman next to me, who's that? He said, why, that's Leopold. So saw a perfect fool not to know. And Leopold got up and he gave an inspiring speech. It was so unselfish and so wise and so witty. And we thought, if ever possible, we want to meet him and see him and get acquainted. And ten years later, we managed it. And that's how we came to be Leopold students. I'm the only woman who got a graduate degree under him. He taught a big class in game management. Both sexes went into that class. But among the graduate students, I was quite the curiosity. Leopold said, now, if Fran needs a thesis for her masters, Frederick is going to do the prairie chickens, but there's a piece we can cut off, we're quite sure, for Fran. And we couldn't cut one off. Everything fitted together. Frederick was a perfectionist. There was no way he could chip something off for me. And I said, well, Aldo, by the way, I've been working on chickadees for three winters, and they're color marked. He said, color marked? I said, yes, each bird is individually color marked. And I've been studying their pet dominance to see who's master and how it goes. Well, this was one of the very first studies with color marking in the world, a pioneer study. Marguerite Baumgartner had color marked some tree sparrows, I believe, in Alaska. And King had color marked some rough grouse in Minnesota. And I color marked chickadees, and we all three started out just almost exactly at the same time. Nobody had done any color marking of wild birds. And so we had to devise techniques. I got much of my equipment at dumps. I've always liked dumps. They always give me an idea. I went to a dump, and there were some celluloid toys. And I brought them all home. Frederick was very much surprised to see this collection of celluloid toys. And I cut the celluloid into little strips, and I wrapped it around a nail that was the size of a chickadee's leg. And then I had my colored bands to put on the chickadees. And the first few chickadees got even better tre treatment, but I went to my jewelry case and I took some of my christening jewelry and took the little gold rings and used them. But I don't have so very many combinations. There's a gold ring over the aluminum, two gold rings on the left, two gold on the right, uh, and you've used up gold. So the dump was a very great help. And later when we went to our prairie chicken work, we used aluminum rings and celluloid rings and it made us made it possible for us to know individual birds and I think it was a great step in uh, saving that species. Yes, we were always hoping that we could work on prairie chickens but we never expected to be able to. And Leopold gave us the prairie chicken project after Franklin Schmidt died in the fire, we were cruising around looking for a place near the Leola and Buena Vista marshes, and we drove by this house. It had a reputation for having ghosts. Every window in front of the house was either broken or cracked. 
somebody had taken all the doors up into the third story and piled them up. So we had to take the doors downstairs and find which door it fitted. And we had a lot of carpentry work to do. Some of the floors fell through. We had to fix them. But before school started, we got this place livable. And then our two small children, I think they were six and eight at the time, with long white night dresses and a candle in their hand, walked all over the house, exploring it. It's been a wonderful headquarters. We've had over 5,000 people come here to spend the night and watch the prairie chickens. And it's interesting, if you want to save a rare species, you do some unexpected things. 5,000 house guests means Frederick and I cooked 14,000 eggs in order to save an endangered species. But do what it takes, thanks to the effort of two competing foundations, which we helped compete in a friendly way, the Prairie Chicken Foundation and the Society of Timpanucus Cupidopinatus. Enough land was bought and enough public interest so that prairie chickens are about as safe as we could make them. So what are these little plants that look like lichens? They're lichens. They're lichens, okay. I remember going on a field trip with uh, Elder Leopold. I was taking classes from him and uh, this was in the spring of 1941. And because I had graduated from University of Minnesota in wildlife management, he probably thought I would be a good candidate to go up and help the hammerstones. So in the spring of 1941, I went up to uh, Hancock, that was before they moved to Plainfield, and helped them uh, trap and ban prairie chickens with their study. In fact, I have a book <laughs> that is autographed to me by Fran, and she says, I am the first gaboon <laughs> that they had. The first, they're one of their uh, workers, you know. Well, in those days we did a good deal of camping in abandoned houses. Leopold spent the first night we spent up in this part of the world in a house we had him sleeping in the living room because the roof didn't leak there. And we slept in the kitchen and we had pans put on the end of the bed and we could hear the water beating in all night, falling into the pans by our feet. He was very good sport about such things. And each one of his students got that attention. He went to Favor Grove, he went to Doug Wade's study area, and he came to ours. Leonard Wing was the only one I knew that didn't have a study area, and he was compiling vast numbers of Audubon censuses, Christmas bird counts, and published his thesis on those. Leopold had some rather pronounced tastes. He said, Fran, I look at that door of yours with its window, and you're one of the few women I ever met who can resist putting a curtain in a window like that. You just leave it plain. He liked that. He loved hearing his children sing and play the guitar. And he was an extremely graceful man. When hunting, he was never off balance. Some people, you go hunting with them, and they have one foot on one side of the barbed wire fence and one on the other when they get grouse flushes. And <laughs> Leopold never seemed to be caught short like that. He always seemed to know, stand perfectly still for a few minutes, the grouse will shut, flush, and then after that, you can cross the fence. He was an excellent cook and I've published some of his recipes. Uh, Aldo Leopold's recipe for woodcock is in my wild food cookbook and he, 
He was an excellent camp cook. And he made sourdough cakes every morning in camp. Simply yummy. And he could make them so quickly. He'd start about three o'clock in the afternoon and put in some yeast and some flour and some water. And the next morning the dough had risen and fallen and already was sourdough. I can't seem to do it so fast. I don't know why. I was thinking about my days as a graduate student of Leopold's. Actually, I was, when I came in, I was an undergraduate. And Frederick went in to get his doctorate. I entered as an undergraduate, took one more course, and became a graduate student. I was very close. Leopold and I were always early risers. And I used to go into his office and past his desk, uh, the, the building that was his office. We stole the building for him, by the way. Uh, graduate students led by the Harmerstroms with the Harmerstrom car. And Art Hawkins with his white sweater, which he put over a lamp so nobody could see what we were doing. And we moved Leopold's office from the potting shed of the university, which we thought was very unsuitable for him. And the gardener potted plants where all the graduate students had to do their paperwork. And we moved the whole thing to 424 University Farm Place between two days. And with wheelbarrows and our car, and we put his desk where we wanted it. We spread everything out so we had the whole ground floor in possession. We got tables and chairs from our own apartments and put them in there. And I got a mason jar and put a vase of flowers on his desk. We moved all the books. And if the yard cops were to come, we were going to give the call of a barred owl. That meant danger. The yard cops are coming. I can't hear a barred owl yet without getting a little tingle of apprehension because of that scary night when we stole everything and moved him into his new office. And then we were still up when he got, came down to work and we said, your office isn't here anymore no longer in the pot by the potting shed. Come, we have the whole floor of 424 Farm Place, an empty farmhouse on the campus. And we showed him everything. And he sat down at the desk and he lit his pipe. And he looked so contented. And then he telephoned the authorities. And the next thing we heard him say was, well, that's not what I was trying to explain to you. It's, it's not that I want to be moved here. I am here. I've already moved here. And that's how he got it. And he had that beautiful office for the rest of his life. And it's a good feeling to know that he did. There was a nice big room for seminars, and there was a big kitchen for the laboratory, and he had a big bay window in his study where he could receive people. And the basement was a good place to keep duck decoys and things like that. And horticulture lived above us on the second floor, and they didn't bother us a bit. I wonder whether students do things like that nowadays. We did it with such love and respect and determination. <laughs>